Hi, everyone. It's Joan. A quick favor. We're conducting an audience survey, and we'd be really grateful if you could take a few minutes and answer some questions about Crushed. Please visit survey.prx.org slash crushed to take the survey. Thanks. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Counseling. Crush tackles some serious mental health topics, and telling this story has helped me understand just how much a person's mental health can drive the decisions and missteps they might make in life. Reaching out can be difficult, but BetterHelp makes the process easier. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist, and you can start communicating in under 48 hours by video, phone, or even live chat. Our listeners get 10% off the first month of online therapy at betterhelp.com slash crushed. That's betterhelp.com slash crushed. Crushed is brought to you by Progressive, one of the country's leading providers of auto insurance. With Progressive's Name Your Price tool, you say what kind of coverage you're looking for and how much you want to pay. And Progressive will help you find options that fit within your budget. Use the Name Your Price tool and start an online quote today at Progressive.com. Price and coverage match limited by state law. It was almost midnight, and the St. Louis Cardinals clubhouse was jam-packed with reporters. Everyone was jostling for space, ducking under cameras, waiting. It was glorious. The circus came to town. That's Associated Press reporter Steve Wilstein. He was part of the scrum that night. I was giddy about it. I was a Little League player who liked hitting home runs, and now to see these guys do it, and as far as they were hitting it, this baseball is best. The Cardinals lost to the Brewers that night, 13 to 10, but no one was there to write about the final score. They were there for Mark McGuire, for his 45th home run of the season. This was July 28th, 1998. All of America was tuned in to the show McGuire and Sammy Sosa were putting on. Each was on pace to break the single-season home run record. And the only question was, who would get there first? But what Wilstein was about to see, and ultimately write about, would raise a much bigger question. At that point, he'd been covering the race for several weeks. He knew McGuire was slow to appear after games, so he gathered color for his story. My philosophy is to bring the reader as close as possible into the scene, into the locker room. And I'm always filling my yellow legal pad with notes about details that may or may not make it into a story. It's just something I did my whole career. And uh, sometimes it pays off. He noticed Cardinals legend Stan Musial's number displayed on the wall above McGuire's locker. He jotted that down. I saw the can of Popeye spinach, which I thought was funny. And then I saw this pack of sugarless gum, and I knew his father was a dentist, so I thought that was cute and all-American. He said it wasn't chewing tobacco. I should probably explain something. Sports lockers are really more like cubbies. There are no doors on the front, no padlocks with combinations. They're just open spaces overflowing with gear, plastered with pictures of wives and kids. If a player wanted to hide something, he wouldn't place it on a shelf for everyone to see. So, Wilstein knew his observations were fair game. And as he scanned the shelf in McGuire's locker one final time, he noticed a small bottle of pills. That should go in the notebook, too, he figured. I didn't know what it was, and so I spelled it out carefully in my notebook. What he wrote was Androstine Dione. It's a mouthful, so most people just call it Andro. And when he carefully copied those 15 letters into his notepad, it set off a chain reaction that would turn the home run race from a party to something very different. A few days later, back at home, Wilstein sat down to write a feature story about the home run race. As he sorted through three pads full of notes, that word caught his eye, Anderstein Dion. What was in that bottle? He picked up the phone. I called a friend of mine who was a doctor and he told me, that it was used by bodybuilders. And he mentioned to me that, you know, somebody using that is probably using other steroids. Remember last episode when Roger Maris Jr. said he suspected McGuire and others were taking steroids? He didn't want to be the one to speak out. So he stayed quiet. 
But Will Stein became that guy. And what he wrote would call into question everything baseball was selling that summer. The excitement, the significance, the all-American wholesomeness of the race. His story was a spark that lit a fire that eventually burned baseball to the ground. I'm Joan Neeson, and this is Crushed. That July night in St. Louis, Will Stein filled his notebook in a clubhouse where some players looked like bodybuilders. By 1998, that was normal in baseball, but it was a new normal. In the decade leading up to McGuire's record-breaking season, players had gotten bigger each year. Swings got more powerful, and scales tipped heavier. But because it happened gradually, pound by pound, homer by homer, some fans didn't notice. Others ignored it. Sure, McGuire didn't look that much bigger than he had a season ago. But compared to a decade ago, he'd totally transformed. To understand how we got there, we have to go back to a specific time and place. America in the 80s. The decade dawned as a reaction to everything that had defined the 70s. Environmentalism, women's lib, gay rights. The 80s were a renaissance for the He-Man. America asserted itself as bigger, stronger, fearless. On TV and at the movies, viewers watched their favorite actors take down everyone, from terrorists to communists to extraterrestrials. I ate green berets for breakfast. And right now, I'm very hungry. I can't believe this macho bullshit. There was Commando, Rambo, Robocop, Predator, Terminator. Arnold Schwarzenegger alone transformed into a barbarian, a rogue special forces operative, and a cyborg assassin. And his body was just as gargantuan in real life. There was no subtlety to this look. A whole lot of muscle was all it took to assert America's supremacy. Bench presses became almost patriotic. On TV, pro wrestling captured boys' imaginations. They all wanted to look like Hulk Hogan. How can I get muscles like you guys? Start by getting in shape with a Hulkamania workout set. Great! Working out became such a staple of American culture, it made it to Saturday Night Live. I'm Hans. I'm Dan Franz. And we want to pump you up. If you don't work out, somebody should grab you by the jockstrap and give you the wedgie of your life. Hans and Franz live in SNL lore as a testament to the bodybuilding craze. That skit debuted in October 1987, just two weeks before Mark McGuire, then in Oakland A, was named the American League Rookie of the Year. Steve Wilstein was based in the Bay Area back then. He often reported from the A's ballpark, and he got to know McGuire. He was a very sweet, nice kid, you know, six foot five, tall, thin. Even then, he had strong, big forearms. He had a really nice swing. McGuire grew up a little league star in the baseball hotbed that is Southern California. He went to a private high school known for elite sports, then to USC, then won a silver medal at the 1984 Olympics. So when the A's drafted him 10th overall that same summer, it seemed like a logical next step. They loved his swing and his surprising power. He was tall and lanky, the epitome of what a baseball player had always looked like. Three years later, McGuire made Oakland's opening day roster. Few expected him to be an all-star by midseason, but that's exactly what he was. From the Oakland A's, number 25, Mark McGuire. He is the first member of the 1984 United States Olympic team to make the all-star game. This was halfway through his rookie season, And the expectations were colossal. At the All-Star Game, Vin Scully was already talking about McGuire breaking the single-season home run record. The projections would show you Mark McGuire would would catch Roger Maris. I wrote about him during that season. I was not friends with him, but friendly with him in that year. And actually, at the 87 All-Star Game, I was standing with him during batting practice. And I never asked people for an autograph, but the ball just happened to roll up to my foot, picked it up, and I asked them to sign it. My daughter was seven at the time. He was her favorite player. And I gave it to her, and she was thrilled. During McGuire's early years in Oakland, Will Stein often took his daughter to A's games. She became one of the Slugger's biggest cheerleaders. She had a little pipsqueak voice, and she's yelling, we want a homer, we want a homer. We were down not far from the uh, batting cage. I think he almost turned around sometimes to hear her. That year, McGuire set the rookie home run record. And that one may be it. Way back 
And there's your record. Mark McGuire puts the A's in front with his major league rookie record 39th home run. McGuire would finish the year with 49. And in an article at the end of the season, Wilstein wrote that the slugger hadn't just broken the old record. He'd made a joke of it. And he would have probably gone over 50, but he decided not to play the final games because his son was born and he wanted to be at the hospital when his son Matt was born. So that was charming too. Listening to Wilstein, it's clear he liked McGuire. He thought he was talented and a decent guy. At the end of that rookie season, Wilstein wrote that McGuire had lifted weights all year, which at the time was practically unheard of in baseball. His teammate, Jose Canseco, was also a workout junkie. And the next spring, they got a nickname to match their muscles. The Bash brothers were born. Well, the Bash started uh, with myself and Jose Canseco. Uh, we were matching forearms one day in the clubhouse, and uh, we decided instead of giving a high five to, to bash our forearms together, and it's just something fun. I was in the Coliseum late one night When my eyes beheld an awesome sight And A's home run had begun to rise When suddenly, to my surprise He did the best The A's made that corny parody themselves. They milked the nickname for all it was worth. And for good reason. The Bash Brothers defined Oakland's style of play. McGuire and Canseco were the faces of the most powerful team in the game. Uh, everybody will remember our team because of the bash and how big we are. It's probably the biggest baseball team in the history of baseball. Wilstein remembers McGuire and Canseco strutting around the A's clubhouse, flexing their muscles and admiring themselves in any mirror they could find. This, the way they looked, the way they acted, was not typical for baseball players. Go back and look at old pictures. Ted Williams was a rail. Babe Ruth had a gut. But those looks became a thing of the past. And a physical therapist named Stan Conti helped baseball make the shift. In the early 90s, weightlifting was basically outlawed. You didn't need biceps to, to throw a baseball or to hit a baseball. Conti worked in the game for two decades and was one of the first physical therapists hired by a major league team. He worked for the Giants, right across the San Francisco Bay from where the Bash brothers held court. There were a few people who were oddballs who were actually in the weight room. There was no weight room, per se. There was some... Uh, rehab equipment that people used as weight equipment. But in the early 90s, some teams began to shift their thinking. It used to be the players would go and they'd show up at spring training, and if they were in shape, they were in shape. If they weren't, they used spring training to go into shape. When Conti came on board, he made a plan to not only get players in shape, but keep them that way. Still, it wasn't enough. In 1996, the Giants had an onslaught of injuries and lost 94 games. The team finished the year on the road in Colorado. There, after a game, Conti got a call from Brian Sabian, the new general manager. He requested a meeting in his hotel room. They called me up like at 11 o'clock at night to talk to me. And so I thought I was going to get fired. They told my wife, I called, I said, I'm going up to see Sabian. I think I'm going to get fired. He went in and he said, we don't have the money to replace injured players. Can you reduce the injuries? I'm not an idiot. I said, yeah, sure, I could do that. So that started our strength and conditioning program. Did you get any pushback from that? Were there players who were like, we've never done it that way? Oh, God, yeah. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I took over the pitcher's running programs. And the pitching coach was a guy named Richard Pohl. And his name was Dick Pohl. So anyway, i just go with that. But he was a great guy. He's an old-time pitching coach, grisly, salt-of-the-earth guy. He kind of threw his hands up and ripped me up and down. This is bullshit and everything. He just really embarrassed the hell out of me in front of all the players. Can you explain the kind of rationale they gave for suggesting players not lift weights and, you know, do that kind of training? What baseball always does is go back in history. Mickey Mantle didn't do that, and look what he did. Willie Mays didn't do that, and look what he did. Nobody really proved or disproved it was good or bad. It's just what was carried forward over the decades. The Giants won 90 games in the first year of Conti's program, thanks to improved health and a big season from their star, Barry Bonds. Strength and conditioning was here to stay. To be clear, Conti had a very specific approach. He didn't want players to lift heavy. He wanted lean muscles and flexibility, not bulk. Across the bridge in Oakland, the Bash brothers had very different goals. There, working out was all about aesthetics and power. Players everywhere began to mimic their look. By the mid-90s, 
lifting weights, lifting heavy weights, had become the norm. Conti had just wanted players to stay healthy, but some wanted to go further. Their focus shifted from anatomy to chemistry. The door opened and everybody ran in. Okay, let's go back to Steve Wilstein in 1998, sitting at his desk. He'd just gotten off the phone with his doctor friend. And if what he said was true, that andro use often signaled someone was also taking anabolic steroids, Wilstein had a much different story on his hands than the one he'd imagined. But before he started writing, he had more research to do and calls to make. First, Wilstein reached out to a few Olympics writers. What did they know about this pill? One answered right away. The International Olympic Committee, or IOC, had outlawed it a year earlier. Not only that, after gold medalist shot putter Randy Barnes tested positive, he was banned for life from the Games. And as Wilstein thought more about what he'd just learned, something else began to nag at him. I had known McGuire for, you know, more than 10 years. I never saw him look like that. In 1998, McGuire was listed at 250 pounds. The average weight in Major League Baseball that season was about 190. That means McGuire was 60 pounds heavier than the average player. You know, your mind is thinking, how did they get so big? Wilstein hadn't set out to answer that question, but he was about to. First, though, he needed to figure out what on earth Andro was. Was it an anabolic steroid, a category of drug that got athletes and other sports into a world of trouble? Wilstein already knew some things about anabolic steroids. He knew that they're synthetic, or man-made, testosterone. And testosterone is a hormone that promotes muscle growth. It also helps you recover faster between workouts. As he made calls, Wilstein learned that androstenedione dione is also a hormone. The body produces it naturally and then converts it into testosterone. Higher testosterone levels help you work out longer and harder, which can lead to bigger muscles. And Wilstein figured that's why athletes got interested. But was Andro a performance-enhancing drug? A PED? Or was it just an innocent, over-the-counter supplement? Back then, that's how the FDA classified it. I went online and found that it was being sold openly on the internet. And then I called uh, GNC and I talked to somebody who I didn't know. And I said, tell me about Androstenone, you know, do you sell a lot of it? And he, he was telling me about how it's very popular among bodybuilders. Turns out, the supplement industry was booming. That's because just a few years earlier, Congress had passed a bill that totally deregulated it. Advertising for this stuff was everywhere. Wilstein didn't know it at the time, but even McGuire had an endorsement deal with a supplement company, one that sold Andro. But if it was legal and all of a sudden deregulated, why had the IOC just banned it? Wilstein found a few reasons. First of all, it could artificially boost performance. So it had the effect of cheating. And it's used usually in conjunction with Winstrol or Stanozolol and Decadurabolin. Those are all anabolic steroids. But I couldn't write about all those things and I didn't want to insinuate at the time that he was using those things, but all I knew was the andro. And as he kept reporting, he found out it wasn't just the IOC that had clamped down. By 1998, the NFL had banned it, and so had the NCAA. So anybody caught using it in an NCAA tournament or in the NFL or in the Olympics would be banned or would be uh, thrown out of the tournaments. Wilstein learned the NBA, NHL, and Major League Baseball still allowed andro use. In fact, when it came to drugs, baseball was particularly lawless. It had no policy at all, just an honor system. Anabolic steroids were technically against the rules, but only because the government had made them illegal in 1990. And that was the extent of baseball's guidance. It told players not to take illegal drugs, but there were no tests and no punishments. So... The thrust of my story wasn't so much a condemnation of McGuire. It was about the difference between baseball's rules and everybody else's rules. 
I can tell you as a reporter, this is the kind of stuff that pushes us to dive deeper into stories, to cast wide nets and try to crack what's really going on. After talking to Wilstein, I wondered what else I could learn about the link between andro and anabolic steroids in baseball. Back in the 90s, players never talked about any of this on the record. Much of what Wilstein learned was rumor, whispers, speculation. What happened in the clubhouse stayed in the clubhouse. 20 years later, it wasn't much easier to break that silence. I reached out to more than 50 men who played baseball during the steroid era, and only five agreed to talk on the record. Royce Clayton played with McGuire on the Cardinals in 98, and he says he never touched Andro. But he has a theory about why players used it. So Andro was just a stage to set the topic of, let's deflect from steroids, and here's what I'm on. And it's not steroids, but it's some new vitamins that nobody knows about. I buy it at GMC, and let's just deflect from the whole topic of steroids because I don't want to talk about what I'm really doing. Let's talk about this little jar I have in my locker and everybody's going to start talking about that, and I'll admit that I'm doing this. His theory makes sense. It was the perfect legal decoy, a bottle to dangle in front of reporters and distract from the conversation they should have been having about anabolic steroid use. Wilstein couldn't corroborate that, so he couldn't publish it. It's a frustrating position to be in, to know from research and background reporting that something is probably true, but to not have quite enough of a confirmation to write it. In that situation, Wilstein wrote responsibly, and he chose his words carefully. As he typed, he referred to Andro as a testosterone-producing pill, a supplement, a drug, a testosterone booster, a product. He never went so far as to call it a steroid, though he quoted a doctor who did. In just a few weeks, Wilstein had learned a great deal about the sports world's attitude toward that bottle of pills in St. Louis. But before the story went to press, he had to fill one hole in his reporting. He needed McGuire to confirm that his andro was more than just locker decor. He needed the slugger to cop to taking it. That's when I got a call from Terry Taylor, our sports editor, who said, I need you to go to Wrigley. You have no other assignment, but I need you to ask McGuire this. That's Nancy Armour, a longtime sports columnist who confronted McGuire about andro. That story, after the break. DraftKings Sportsbook, America's top-rated sportsbook app, is putting you in the center of the action with endless ways to make it rain. From live betting to betting on your favorite players, they do it all. Check out the app every day this week to cash in on their daily odds boost. And now for a limited time, DraftKings Sportsbook is giving all new players a deposit bonus up to $1,000 when signing up using promo code CRUSHED. Must be 21 or older, New Jersey, Indiana, or Pennsylvania only. New customers only, restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com sportsbook for details. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or in Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. Odoo is a suite of business apps, but what does that really mean? You're on your computer, maybe in your PJs, maybe not. You have a tab open with a dashboard of applications, one for every department in your company. There's manufacturing, accounting, website, purchase, and more. You click on the CRM app and reach out to new opportunities. Then you click on the inventory app to make sure your stock levels are good before clicking on the sales app to send a quote to a customer. How many tabs do you have open? Just one. Odoo makes things simple. Go to odoo.com slash sports to start a free trial. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash sports. Welcome back. Just before the break... You met Nancy Armour. So I was working at the Associated Press in the summer of 98. I had actually just moved to Chicago. Steve Wilstein enlisted her help to confirm that McGuire had used Andro. It was the last detail he needed before his story could run. The Cardinals were in Chicago, and Armour headed to Wrigley Field. I was not familiar with Andro until then. In fact, I needed Burt Rosenthal, the track writer. I, I had to call him and say, okay, how do I pronounce this? And I do remember having that in my notebook, like having it spelled out phonetically so I would know how to pronounce it with McGuire. Armour had followed the home run race all summer, and she knew her way around Wrigley. But that weekday series was a zoo. In the time since Wilstein's trip to St. Louis, 
the home runs had continued to pile up. In fact, remember the game I told you about in the last episode? When McGuire and Sosa traded blows? The fans who have come here today have gotten their money's worth. This is that game. If you've been to Wrigley, the visitor's clubhouse is basically a dungeon. That clubhouse is my least favorite place, like in all of sports. (laughs) It's the worst. And McGuire had not been in the clubhouse before the game, before batting practice. So I basically had to follow him off the field to ask him about this. And actually, I had been off because I had just moved into a new apartment and had dropped a desk on my foot. So I've got broken toes. So I'm in like a walking boot and he's, you know, walking quickly. I am hobbling along in this boot and I basically chase him through the catacombs of Wrigley Field and follow him upstairs. I'm saying, you know, Mark, I'm Nancy Armour. I'm with the Associated Press. Can I ask you a couple questions? And he kind of looked over his shoulder and had ignored me. So there are these very steep stairs that lead into the visitor's clubhouse in Wrigley. And so he's walking up the steps and you could hear the clunking. I'm almost positive that's why he finally stopped because he realized that, you know, here I'm hobbling after him. But finally he stopped and he's a couple stairs ahead of me. He's a big guy to begin with. I'm not very tall. And so he's like looming over me. (laughs) And I said, I just need to ask you a couple questions. And he's like, what, what? And I, I said, you know, one of our writers happened to see a bottle of Androstein I own in your locker. And so I wanted to know what you know about it. And he's like, everybody knows about it. Everybody takes it. I asked him why he took it and where he got it. And I remember him saying that his brother, who had was a big bodybuilder in Southern California, had gotten it for him and that everybody in the brother's gym used it and that there was nothing wrong with it, that he was doing nothing wrong. I do remember him saying, it's legal. There's nothing wrong with me taking it, which technically he was correct because it was not banned by baseball. And I said, you know, thank you for answering my questions. And I turned and I walked off. There it was. McGuire confirmed he didn't just have Andrew in his locker. He'd taken it. Wilstein's story was ready to run. Sitting on the top shelf of Mark McGuire's locker, next to a can of Popeye spinach and packs of sugarless gum, is a brown bottle labeled Andro Steendion. Steve Wilstein, reading his story two decades after it ran in newspapers across America under the headline, Drug Okay in Baseball, Not Olympics. In retrospect, it reads as almost too fair toward McGuire. No one suggests that McGuire wouldn't be closing in on Roger Maris's home run record without the over-the-counter drug. But the drug's ability to raise levels of the male hormone, which builds lean muscle mass and promotes recovery after injury, is seen outside baseball as cheating and potentially dangerous. Everything I've done is natural. Everybody that I know in the game of baseball uses the same stuff I use, said McGuire. However, many other players insist they do not take androstein Dione. At the beginning of this episode, I told you that the moment Will Stein spotted McGuire's pills was a turning point when the home run race became something else. And I can say that now, 23 years later. But at the time, almost no one saw it that way. Wilstein had written a story about baseball's lack of a drug policy. But readers took it as an accusation that McGuire was a fraud. Fans refused to hear it. They'd invested so much in the home run race, in McGuire, that they took the story as an affront. Yeah, I think it's no story, really. It's just something that the media's chasing. If it's legal, do it. That's just smart. That's not stupid. Oh, uh, well, for one thing, he hit 49 home runs right. a year before that Andrew, whatever it is, was even invented. McGuire himself pointed a finger at Will Stein to distract from the implications of what he'd written. There was no basis on that article. The basis was that some guy from the AP was snooping in my locker. Tony LaRussa, who was McGuire's manager during his early years in Oakland and again in St. Louis, was outraged. He threatened to ban media from the clubhouse, even though he had no power to do so. This guy goes to the gym every day and works. All that hard work is being tainted by crap like this. Wilstein doesn't think he overstepped, and neither do I. It's not as if he went looking for salacious details about McGuire. He only reported on things relevant to his story. And Andrew was just that. It might have had a direct effect on the home run race, and baseball wasn't regulating it. You know, if I had seen something like Viagra, I never would have reported it because it wouldn't have any relevance to baseball. 
But if you see something that is a testosterone booster, well, that does have to do with baseball. Here's Nancy Armour again. It was really telling to watch people be so defensive and so protective of baseball and not looking at the reporting that Steve had done and not even listening to McGuire's own words. Like, he acknowledged taking the stuff. The most common accusation was that Wilstein was poking around and digging through his locker, like skulking around the clubhouse, you know, looking for something to get McGuire, which that wasn't the case. Like, if you knew Steve, that wasn't the type of, of reporter that he was. Um, he's also a very, very tall man, so the idea of him skulking around anywhere unnoticed is laughable. Even other journalists were hostile toward the scoop. In St. Louis, they were especially protective. One columnist said Wilstein's reporting was, quote, out of bounds. And Jack Buck, the Cardinals' beloved broadcaster whose word was gospel in St. Louis, he discredited the story too. Well, if people want to detract from it and look at the negative aspects of it and fail to enjoy it, that's all right with me. I, for one, am taking great joy in this, as are the people who will be at the ballpark in each of the next few nights. Wilstein had hardly published a character assassination, but he had to defend himself as if he'd slandered McGuire. Here he is on CNN. I would absolutely agree with him that Mark McGuire's record should not be tainted. He's earned it. I think he's, he's a wonderful athlete, a good man, and a good person on the field and off the field, and he deserves everything he gets. Looking back, it's shocking to see such a one-sided reaction. Wilstein had uncovered the beginnings of baseball's biggest scandal since Pete Rose bet against his own team. And instead of thinking critically, most people plugged their ears and yelled. If I turn on a sports talk radio in my car, I would hear people really angry about the story and, and attacking me. Then they'd call me all kinds of names, a lot of expletives. There was also a lot of hate letters and emails that were violent. They took it as an attack on McGuire, but in a sense, they take it as an attack on themselves because they're so involved and immersed in him. People don't like to see their heroes taken down. And again, I wasn't trying to take down McGuire. At 10, I didn't really understand why this was such a big deal. But I did read about Anderstein Dione in the local paper and wanted to know how to pronounce it. My dad's a doctor, so I asked him. He doesn't remember that, but he does remember the drama. I think McGuire gets a bad rap because he was the one where the sports writer came and and snuck in and looked at his locker where he had his, his andro pills. He didn't sneak in. It was an open locker room, totally legal. Right. But it, it, <laughs> the, he wasn't, what I'm trying to say, he wasn't trying to hide it. I can understand how my dad, as a fan, might defend McGuire. But as a journalist, I can't help but defend Wilstein. I've jotted down the contents of a player's locker more times than I can count and gotten so many story ideas from what I've seen. I'm not unique in that respect. I can't imagine how awful I'd feel if my colleagues chose to protect an athlete rather than defend a story I'd fairly reported. But Wilstein had bigger things on his mind. That summer, while all of this was going on, his wife battled breast cancer. I was dashing back and forth between cities covering the home run chase and going to the hospital while she was getting chemo and radiation. This is her second bout of breast cancer, and... She had a long history of illness, so I was going to the hospital, dashing off from San Francisco to Seattle to St. Louis to Chicago and wherever the the home run chase was. I didn't get a whole lot of sleep that summer. By August 21st, when the Andro story hit newsstands, McGuire had 51 homers, and Wilstein had moved on to another assignment, Tennis's U.S. Open in New York. I had been assured by the doctor and by my wife that she'd be okay and, you know, recovering from the treatment she was getting. So I went to New York hoping that that was the case, and we released the story. I was in the hotel room afterwards answering one phone call off the other from radio stations, and then I got a call from the doctor to come back, and my wife had lapsed into a coma. Meanwhile... McGuire kept inching closer to Maris. When he broke the record, it was, you know, maybe on the television in the visiting room. But I wasn't paying a whole lot of attention. I didn't really care anymore. I just was 
more involved with my wife, my daughter, and family that were coming in and out. Wilstein's wife passed away just three days after McGuire hit 62. His grief drowned out the drama around the story. But even the record didn't stop fans' attacks. To them, and to Major League Baseball, Wilstein had written a hit piece. Not only on McGuire, but on all the fun everyone was having. The league had no incentive to engage. It was too busy building up McGuire and Sosa as role models, heroes, the best thing baseball had to offer. But the sport was also caught clueless. Commissioner Bud Selig later admitted he'd never heard of Andro when Wilstein's story dropped. He went to a pharmacy near his home in Milwaukee and asked about it. That's right. The man in charge was totally ignorant about a popular substance most sports had banned. Baseball froze. It embraced a culture of silence around PEDs. And Andro was just the tip of the iceberg. Baseball's problem went way beyond this one questionable drug, and way beyond superstars, too. Next time on Crushed. I remember the first day in the locker room, um, there's this guy behind me, he's like 6'5", big buff dude, and I'm like, man. He's like, how many home runs you hit this past year? He's a, I'm a pitcher. I'm like, oh gosh, there's no chance. I have no chance in professional baseball. Hundreds of players used steroids in the 90s and early 2000s. We'll hear about why they used and how they stomached the decision to cheat. Crushed is written and reported by me, Joan Neeson. Jessica Popovac is our senior producer. Our associate producer is Devin Manzi. And our production assistant is Megan Coyle. Michael Garofalo is our editor. Jane Ackerman fact-checked the series. And Dan DeZula mixed this episode. Gotham Chopra, Amith Sankaran, and Adam Schlossman are our executive producers. Special thanks to Lisa Pollock and to composer Michael Kramer. Crushed is a production of Religion of Sports and PRX. If you like the show, please follow us and leave us a review wherever you do your listening. On behalf of everyone on the Crush team and at Religion of Sports, we want to thank sponsors Odoo, Progressive, DraftKings, and BetterHelp Online Counseling for supporting the show and its creators during our launch. 